Okay, stop me if you've heard this before. Chrono Trigger is one of the greatest video games of all time. Bravely second! You all know about Chrono Trigger's legacy. There are a billion videos praising it as a masterpiece, and it'd be redundant to add another to the pile. That being said, I'd certainly like to, and that's a threat. It's as close as you can get to a perfect RPG. But we're not going to talk about that today. Instead, I'd like to talk about its controversial younger brother, Chrono Cross. People love this game. People hate this game. It's probably one of the most polarizing titles in Square's PS1 catalog. I still remember starting Chrono Cross while recovering from my wisdom teeth surgery when I was 16 and... Wait, wait a second. What's that? Oh god. It's the realization that I'm old! No! Look away! When I first played this eight years ago, fresh off the high of Chrono Trigger and dental anesthetic, I loved it. Until I didn't. Look, I was that guy at the party. Every time someone even uttered the word Chrono, I'd step in and be like, Yeah, Trigger's goaded and Cross sucks, I hate that game. Yeah, I didn't get invited to many parties. You see, I found the beginning of the game great, but felt that a massive shift that happened after the first act ruined just about everything I loved. While I've spent the last eight years being that guy, I can thankfully say I was never one of those guys. You know the ones. The ones mad it wasn't just Trigger 2. I must humbly request that Cross fans not listen to their arguments, dripping in a malodorous vat of bad faith. I just felt the game failed at being itself, and I spent years being extremely vocal about that sentiment. It wasn't until I opened up a Patreon and saw the overwhelming demand for me to revisit it that I realized, wait a second, I don't even like 16 year old me. Why should I listen to anything he had to say? At that moment, I forged a capitalism fueled pact to face my fears and give Chrono Cross another shot. And I'm glad I did. I was right to doubt 16 year old me. This game is great, but it's also ungreat. It's complicated. Look, how much time do you got right now? How about roughly two parts of a YouTube series worth? This first video is dedicated to the general gameplay and opening hours, with the second one being a detailed analysis of the story. Oh, you're saying you do have the time and you'd love to hear me talk about it? Great. Then I guess you're cool enough to join me on my journey to come to terms with Chrono Cross. Let's open our minds, dust off our PS3s, and re-download the PS Classic version to take the plunge. You'll never take me alive! Chrono Cross begins like its predecessor, with a boy being awoken by his mother on a beautiful, sunny day. Just kidding! This is the late 90s, not the mid 90s. Completely different landscape. Now we've got fancy FMV technology, media res, epic pre-rendered backgrounds, innovative new combat mechanics, Australians! Wow, bugger! Dead Australian! Wait, what? Oh, I might stop your engine. Oh my god! Oh, oh, oh god. Another one of those dreams. I need to lay off the Tim Tams before bed. When comparing the two Kron openings, you're immediately aware of just how different Cross presents itself right off the bat. Its usage of media res stands for a lot more than just hinting at events to come. It sets the tone of the game, a mystery full of intrigue, vagueness, striking imagery, and cats. The whimsy that defined Trigger was gone. Or was it? For a Chrono fan, the more traditional intro that follows is meant to be comforting, going as far to have the exact same opening line from Trigger. It lulls them into a relaxing sense of security, but the events that just transpired will be sure to stay fresh in their mind. This is Surge. He's a radical beach dude who has spent his entire life in Arnie, a quaint fishing village on the mainland of the El Nido archipelago. He lives with his mother Marge, his father Wazuki no longer being in the picture. Spending the time to talk to villagers can actually teach you quite a lot about him. Surge has had a hard life, dealing with past traumas like almost being killed by a panther and nearly drowning as a child. I'm sure not at the same time, of course. That'd be overkill, come on. <laughs> 
As you learn about the world, tinker with the combat system, and go on a fetch quest for your childhood friend Lena, you'll notice something. This game is beautiful. While I wouldn't say it's the best looking PS1 game, that's Vagrant Story, Chrono Cross might have the strongest aesthetic on a system that produced the best aesthetics in gaming history. Pre-rendered backgrounds are amazing, and I will fight anyone who says otherwise shirtless on the Millennium Tower, and I will win. Whether you're roaming the gorgeous overworld, navigating through dense forests, exploring the main city of Termina, or just traversing a dungeon, Chrono Cross is always visually stunning. The places you visit overflow with diversity, yet always feel as parts of a cohesive world. They're distinct, with no two places ever looking the same. Okay, well maybe not exactly. Wink, wink. I can't wink. While Surge wraps up another ordinary day in paradise with Lena on the shore of Opasa Beach, discussing the nature of growing up, the passage of time, and how aging can change people, he starts to see flashbacks connecting to his previous experiences on this beach. And then, it happens. Chrono Trigger was about time travel, taking you on an adventure set throughout the world and across a multitude of eras. From the outset, Cross's ambitions were always more personal, so instead of traveling through time, the focus was shifted to traveling between dimensions. Two of them. When Surge wakes up on what looks like the same beach, he realizes that he's all alone now. By traveling back to Arnie, he discovers something's off. Not only does no one know who he is, but they're saying the only Surge they know of is a young boy who drowned years ago. Yeah, that's right. Surge is stuck in a world where he died as a child. And if that wasn't enough, he also learned that his mom died shortly after his passing. Because of this, all of Serge's friends and acquaintances grew up differently, living entirely new lives. Can you imagine learning all of this, unsure if you'd ever be able to return home, trapped in a world that essentially grew up without you? That's fucked up, horrifyingly existential, literally the worst day anyone could have, and I love it. The game uses the opportunity to convey this feeling with the music as well. When you're in the home world, there's this really laid back tropical vibe to all the music that instantly endears you, only to rip it right away when you get stranded in the another world. That, that sentence might not sound grammatically correct, but it is. This is the home world, this is another world. It, it's, it's fine, I'm fine, I know how to write scripts really good. Yasunori Matsuda's work on this game soundtrack, besides a couple songs here and there, makes it stand out as one of the best RPG OSTs of all TIME. While standing over his own grave, Serge's deep introspective moment is broken up by a bunch of cartoon characters. Like, can you read the room? It turns out someone knew Surge would be here, and as the mysteries begin to stack up and danger draws near, a familiar face comes to his aid. This is when your adventure begins, and I'm willing to bet it's unlike any you've ever seen. And as we'll find out later, that's not entirely a compliment. But I'm getting ahead of myself. We need to get something out of the way first. I love this game now, but I'm gonna be mean to it where I see fit. I can't help it. It's out of love. What really impressed me, and I'm sure a ton of people back in 1999, is how open and replayable Chrono Cross is. From this very moment, several choices you make have serious consequences on how your game will play out. Eventually your story will always come around to about the same conclusion, unless you're doing New Game Plus, but that's for another day in another timeline, which is to say I will not be talking about that, but the people you meet throughout your journey and the events you witness to get there won't be exactly the same. There are a total of 45 party members in Chrono Cross, and your decisions will dictate who will join you and who won't in your playthrough. That's right gamers, 
you cannot recruit every character in one playthrough. While I respect its ambition in this aspect, we'll find out later that it tends to fumble this quite often. Meet Kid. No, not a child made of meat. This is Kid, a major character who quickly asks if you want to join her to find the mythical Frozen Flame. Now, for this playthrough, I wanted to experiment early on to see what would happen if I didn't follow the path clearly laid out for me. So I turned her down. I mean, hey, what's the worst that could happen? Oh, I, I guess I'm stuck with Lena and this. Oh God, what is that? Get it away from me! Oh, Kid, I am so sorry. Please take me back. I will do anything. You want some Tim Tams? I got some Tim Tams! Kid's importance to the plot makes it a very good idea to keep her around if you're trying to play this game the right way. But the fact that the game is extremely flexible offers a ton of replayability that you just don't see much in games of this era without a big Saga logo slapped on the front cover. Saga Frontier is really good and the remaster is really good and you should buy it. It's a really good game. Buy, buy, buy Saga Frontier Remaster. It's one of the best. 7 out of 10. Suffice it to say, from this moment on, I decided to never be mean to Kid. It wouldn't be fair to Chrono Cross or our little experiment if I picked choices that made it harder to engage with the story. And fortunately for us, Kid's a pretty solid party member. She can steal items from enemies and bosses, which can make dealing with the combat system in the first act way more manageable. Also, okay, maybe I just wanted to bench the dog. You look at that and tell me there's a god. Now, you're probably wondering, Cullen, with 45 party members, how does Cross manage to make them all feel fleshed out in terms of story and gameplay? Well, I can answer that easily. It doesn't. Your party members range from interesting to paper thin. If you're going in a cross expecting the same subtle depth the trigger cast had, you're going to be disappointed. However, to say that this was a complete failure would be a gross exaggeration. A majority of the cast have very clear motivations, backstories, and arcs that are executed rather well. They tend to not get too much development, but what is there packs a punch. In cutscenes, they usually have slightly different takes on the same dialogue, with a whole dialect system programmed in it that's... yeah... But there are moments where keeping a character in your party during certain events can unlock unique dialogue that adds to their respective arcs. They all have personal reasons to join you in your quest to find the frozen flame, which tie together with the game's interconnecting themes. The son of a painter hiding his creative aimlessness behind a snarky, sarcastic attitude. An old man past his prime, living with the regret of his mistakes. A pirate forced to deal with the consequences of his life of inaction. Three childhood friends who were torn apart by both the passage of time and the destinies that fate forced them to pursue. Taking time to go out of your way to help these characters with their problems requires some effort, but is absolutely worth doing if you want to get the most from the story. There's also a giant mushroom man. He ate a mushroom and became a mushroom man. He wants to not be a mushroom man. That's all you get. Chrono Cross and Tonal Inconsistency go hand in hand. And frankly, I am here for it. Sadly, the cast's unique and diverse backgrounds don't really reflect in the gameplay outside of their special moves in combat. See that segue? Was I proud of that? Not really. I guess we're gonna talk about the beating people up part. I'm not sure you've noticed yet, but Chrono Cross's desire to separate itself from its predecessor is going to be a running theme in these videos. And this applies to the battle system too. The snappiness, speed, and simplicity of that game is gone, but that doesn't make Cross's combat bad. If anything, I like it a lot. Sometimes. Enemies appear on the field, so there are still no random battles, but because of the ambition of the engine just barely being held together with duct tape and thumbtacks on the PS1, battles now take place in the good old combat dimension. I will forgive this most grievous of sins, though, because they're gorgeous. Chrono Trigger respected the player's time with its battles, and despite drastically slowing down the pace, Cross manages to do that as well, but in a couple of unique ways. The need for grinding has been completely removed, and now you can run away from almost every single fight in the game. 
Have you ever played an RPG and found yourself completely immersed in the world and setting, and then had that immersion shattered by constant random battles that were almost impossible to run away from? Trust me, Xenogears battle theme left enough mental scars on me too, and while Chrono Crosses isn't on the same level, the battle theme does manage to flare up my anxiety in the same way. Stop! Anyway, your party doesn't level up in the traditional JRPG manner, instead only doing so after major boss battles. These star levels you gain apply to your whole squad, giving you the freedom to customize your active party however you see fit, since they all level up together. It also makes the game balanced, letting you always be at the right level. While this does help the casual fan a lot and removes the need for grinding, players who tend to enjoy breaking a game in half won't won't really be able to do so here without a bit of work. The first few random battles you engage in after bosses will give your active party members minor stat boosts, but are mainly used to obtain money and material to make gear. Overall, this system is way ahead of its time and has made Cross Age better than many of its PS1 contemporaries, and a lot of modern RPGs too. You see this guy right here? When you get the chance, make him talk to his other self. He'll give you an item that lets you forge weapons and equipment almost anywhere. You don't have to go back to town anymore. There are games today that lack that level of quality of life. And I'm looking at you bravely too. It's a godsend. Although I will say, the combat mechanics themselves can feel needlessly complicated at times. Now if I could draw your attention to the totally real, not made up PhD I keep on my wall. This unfortunately was not given to me for my ability to explain technical complexities of RPG mechanics. Luckily for you, there are some videos on YouTube that will probably do a better job explaining how all this works than I can, but I'm going to give it a swing anyway. Okay, so there's like a stamina bar and hit percentages. Uh, element grid. Uh, element sphere. Summon. Uh, element. Use diminish to make the game more hit mean more good. Active time battle, but, but not really. Allocation. Get the colors in the right order, or you can't beat the final boss. Okay, listen. What you need to know is that each character has a stamina bar that goes down with each attack. Each character has a light, medium, and heavy attack. The stronger the smack, the harder it is to initially land. With three different hit percentages that absolutely lie to you. Please, just land a hit, I'm begging you. But with every attack that connects, your hit percentages for all three increase. So the safe thing to do is to start with light attacks and work your way up until you can manage to land the big bonk. By the end though, I found myself playing riskier just to get the mandatory fights out of the way ASAP. If you play this yourself, remember that medium attacks are kind of your best friend in the late game if you want things to die fast. Oh yeah, attacks that land, and yeah, I know I'm saying the word attack a lot, but you should be able to understand why I might be a little limited in my vocabulary when referring to gameplay mechanics where you have to hit people with sticks. <laughs> also increase your combat level. That's right, the cold Crypt Keeper hand of gameplay systems isn't done with you yet. Your combat level decides which elements you can use. Chrono Cross, trying to be oh so complicated and cool in that late 90s way, decided it was too tubular for items or magic. And it was right. Traditional items have been completely erased from the formula, instead being replaced by elements. Elements are your abilities, combat items, and spells now under the same umbrella. You place these elements on an ever-growing grid that expands the more you increase your star level. When I played this eight years ago, I found the system confusing and frustrating because without the right elements, battles can wreck you. But now, as a 24-year-old with complete control over his life who plays way too many video games at the same time, time, every 30 minutes, click that button. You are now ready for 99% of the battles in this game. Yeah, you could set them all manually if you'd like, but I, I think we need to cherish the conveniences we have in life when they pop up. Speaking of that, you can even remove all of the equipped elements from every party member at once, making it pretty easy to switch things around on a whim and then allocate elements for your new active party with ease. For most of the game, each element can only be used once in battle with the exception of consumables. While the removal of MP felt strange at first, elements grew on me. Your items are somewhat comparable to a point and click game's adventure screen, requiring you to reach into Surge's impossibly big cross-dimensional shorts 
its pockets to show people items to progress in the story. Hey old lady, would you like to see the skull of your dead grandson? Oh god, why have you done this? I don't know! This was an interesting choice that makes Chrono Cross stand out. I love it. Look, I enjoy point-and-click adventure games a lot. I like RPGs. Combine the more game industry or I'll have to get my hands dirty and do it myself. This is another threat. Early on, the game can be pretty challenging. Since your characters will have a small pool of elements and an incredibly tiny grid to put them on. But as Chrono Cross goes on, the difficulty becomes next to non-existent. Every party member has an element type they excel in, and each element type has a weakness. Look at this chart. This ain't your dad, Shin Megami Tensei. It's your little brothers. And no, I will not further elaborate that point. Call your brother. He misses you. Unless your brother sucks. Then I'll be your brother, and I'm proud of you. Earlier, I alluded to the game not doing a great job at making your party members stand out in terms of gameplay. And I mostly stick by that. Everyone can use any element, but they each have unique special attacks equipped by default. You can also have specific party combinations to do dual and triple techs. Yeah, that's right. The coolest part of Chrono Trigger is back, and I was not able to record any footage to show you of this. They're incredibly difficult to unlock, and by the end of the game, when you'll have most of the party members to do them, you kill everything so fast you'll never be able to build up to using them. They're just not worth it. Look up a video on YouTube, that's what I did. Still, all the characters can easily spec into certain roles, such as all-rounders, damage dealers, speedsters, mages, and wastes of character slots. There's also an alien? And I shit you not, he is the most important character in the entire game! He is responsible for saving the world, the true hero! All hail Starkey! Anyway, here's the TLDR. Pick the characters you like, keep your party equipped with a large variety of elements, diminish, bonk with sticks until dead, rinse and repeat. There's also an element grid on the top left that you can... Oh, used to do spells better, and could summon a giant lizard. Oh, fuck. Oh. Mm. oh, oh no, I slept through the video footage. What's, what's going on with Surge and Kid? Oh god! Make sure to ask your parents permission before going to Neopets. What did I miss? This is Lynx. He's the main antagonist. He sucks. But let's rewind. Right after you meet back up with Kid and Termina, you hatch a plan to sneak into the elusive Viper Manor. I mentioned choices earlier, and this is one of the earliest moments where they can drastically affect the gameplay. I love this section. Without making it incredibly obvious, Chrono Cross gives you three choices that decide how you'll break into Viper Manor. There are three people in this city that can serve as your guide. And if this is your first time playing, you'll probably just go with the first person you find. The character you end up picking also locks you out of recruiting the other two. I decided to go with Guile. He seemed cool. After having finished the game, I still don't really know what his deal is. He feels unfinished, but familiar. Why don't I get this feeling of deja vu? Wait, wait a second. Is, is, my, is my nose bleeding? Holy, holy shit, I need to fuck. He's really strong early on, and if you pick him, he'll basically carry you through Viper Manor. Oh, I like your funny words, magic man. But unfortunately, he begins to fall off later thanks to a pathetically small element grid. Anyway, we get a boat, frustratingly climb the manor's cliffside, and finally sneak in. You make your way through fighting... Was the art director okay? This is horrifying. Is this what your nightmares look like? Okay, look, so Kid is angry at Lynx for doing a big orphan murder and spitting on Trigger fans. In response, he stabs her with a plot-convenient poison. And before you all fall off a cliff, Lynx leaves you with the most cryptic shit ever. Now come to me, Surge. The assassin of time. The Chrono Trigger. <laughs> no. Cowabunga!
Despite being the second game in the Chrono series and the devs going out of their way to tell people this was not a sequel to Trigger, that's not really true. Like, at all? If you haven't played Trigger, you're going to be extremely lost, especially when the exposition gets real dumpy towards the end. Although, to be fair, you'll probably be lost no matter what. The second half of this game is an experience. I cannot wait for part two. Some of the best content in the entire game is how it reflects back on and expands the science and lore introduced in Chrono Trigger, which in my opinion, ultimately managed to hit way more than it missed. We'll be saving all that for next time, but I have to say, when I saw Link scream at this teenage beach bum that he was the best SNES RPG, I, I, I couldn't help but laugh. It, it makes sense in the long run, yeah, but oh god, this got me good. Okay, so I've been relatively positive on the game so far, yeah, kinda made fun of it here and there, but you know, it's all in good fun. Amazing music, immaculate vibes, slightly overcomplicated yet still enjoyable and unique combat system. Chrono Cross is a pretty fun time, but we need to talk about the elephant corpse in the den. I mentioned before that how choice operated in the game was messy, so now we're going to talk about the game's biggest mess. How decision making intersects with a juvenile usage of theming. Chrono Cross is a melting pot of ideas. Sometimes the flavors come together in a surprisingly tasty way, and other times they add too much to the pot, making the whole thing undercooked. From my analysis at the moment, there are two main themes of Chrono Cross that I was able to pick up on, identity and environmentalism. The former is handled with so much subtlety that it almost makes it come across kind of half-baked, while the latter is lacking basically any amount of nuance. Sometimes the latter works extremely well in the story, and sometimes there's some good overlap. But when the game focuses mainly on the former, that was always the most interesting stuff for me. Again, I love Chrono Cross despite and because of its flaws. But there is an arc in this game that I simply cannot defend in any capacity. So it's revealed that kids' plot-convenient poison is life-threatening, and the only way to cure it would be to get the humor of a Hydra, which would have been found in the Hydra marshes. The catch is, they are extinct in this world. The clock's ticking. Not really, though, because this is a story-driven JRPG. But at this point, you probably have the good idea that Hydras still exist in your home world. So you're left with a choice. Save the life of a girl who previously went out of the way to save yours when you were all alone in this dimension, or leave her to die. And hang out with the boys! Everyone, let's go! Oh yeah! How good are we? Obviously, if you like Kid or just don't want to be responsible for her death, you're gonna save her. Let's do it. <laughs> so, uh, guess what? Almost every decision you make where you choose to be nice to Kid will result in locking you out of some of the best party members in the game. This is Glenn. Like his namesake, he is the coolest dude ever. Glenn is the only way you can unlock X-Cut. If you save Kid's life, you don't get Glenn. You don't get X-Cut. When I got here again, after all these years, with the knowledge of what lies behind the guilt-ridden second door of fate, I was stuck at an impasse. I wanted to give this game's story every possible chance to impress me. I knew the narrative significance of Kid, and hell, I even found her to be an enjoyable character. Now here's something about me you might not know. I am incredibly susceptible to being emotionally invested in games I play. Decision making sends me spiraling. I spent two hours resetting my Animal Crossing island before I was satisfied, just to drop the game a few weeks later and not touch it for an entire year. Just because? I was worried that the animals would be mad at me. My mind goblins are that bad. Villainous role playing in an RPG makes me feel actual pain. This is not me saying that I'm better than those who can do that. I am just incapable of living with the guilt I know the game will shower me with. So, for the purposes of our experiment, I said goodbye to X-Cut. <laughs> Little did I know, none of it fucking mattered, but we'll get to that. It's at this point where we finally get the ability to travel between dimensions. Surge finally makes it back home, but now he has a goal and needs to accomplish it by any means necessary. 
All right, no time for distractions. We need to- Oh, well, I don't want this fairy to be eaten alive. So yeah, we kill this thing. Save Razli and invite her to our party. I'm sure glad I was looking around for optional content, but I do wonder who could have put this harmless creature in this pit? They'd have to be pure evil to do that. The dwarves live in this forest and worship the Hydra. This Hydra is the last one in the world. This would be an interesting moral dilemma if we didn't find this out now and you weren't already locked into your choice. But hey, let's see where they're going with this. Since this is a JRPG, you solve your problem with violence. You beat the dwarves, kill the Hydra to obtain the humor, and save Kid's life. However, because Razli is in our party, we learn that the Hydra is actually having babies! So we didn't really drive the Hydras to extinction! Good job, you did it! Yay! Okay, so I kind of like this. In a way, the game is making commentary about the tendency of players going with the flow and doing reprehensible things because they're told to. Tackling topics like this in 1999 was genuinely ambitious. While it's a shame it cheaps out, the only way you learn there's a hopeful ending is if you went out of your way to save Razli. I'm sure they'll keep up the good effort and continue to handle these kind of themes with all the grace of a- This is the part of the video where I cut to the live action segment where I stare directly at the camera to signify that I know how they fucked it up. So now we have Kid back. You're given a vague goal. Go to Fort Draconia. You have to figure out how to get there by exploring both worlds. It's a bit directionless, but this part of the game is amazing. Since you have a boat now, it drastically opens up where you can go in the another world. And yes, grammar, I know, whatever, let's keep going. You get a chance to treat yourself to the amazing boat music. Explore the various islands. Check out an abandoned Viper Manor during the day. Discover the dwarves decided to invade Water Dragon Isle to kill all the fairies and take their home for themselves. Have a super wacky pirate ghost adventure. Wait, what? What the fuck? So let me get this straight. The dwarves got mad that humans killed the Hydra, so they decide to murder all the fairies and steal their home? Oh yeah, this makes total sense! Look, the idea of victims of a travesty caused by selfish violence could lash out against an uninvolved third party? Yeah, okay, that's interesting and makes you step back and question your actions. Cycle of violence, am I right? Not necessarily a bad story trope despite what many would tell you, since execution is what always matters, but... Uh, they have a fucking tank! The dwarves, almost accidentally, are made out to be comically evil, yet the writing keeps framing it as primarily the human's fault. Which, that's fine. We personally had a big part in their actions. Except not always, because the story needs you to be here to get the ice breath and to get to Fort Draconia. If we hadn't killed the Hydra, someone else apparently does. And Kid just kind of shows up at some points like, hey, what's up? I'm fine, huh? In my opinion, this really takes away from a lot of what did work with this scene in theory. Also, were the humans responsible for that innocent fairy you tried to have eaten alive for the fun? of it you absolute pieces of shit oh i feel like i got an aneurysm anyway i digress you beat them and since razley was on our party she just goes oh yeah uh i forgot to mention the hydras aren't extinct at all oh we're sorry about all that then oh it has a pickle in it Y'all have a good day then! Ah, uh, bye! How could the humans do this to us?! You're supposed to feel bad for the dwarves, and earlier, yeah, I could totally see that. But their militaristic nature makes that borderline impossible. There are ways this could have worked. And, like I said, the idea of putting an environmentalist spin on typical RPG shit where you're constantly running around and killing creatures because video games? That's cool. I enjoy media that criticizes humanity's destructive tendencies. Yes, I think Nier is my favorite game. Why do you ask? Thankfully, this is the worst of it. There are moments where Cross's message about needing to appreciate nature before it's too late and understanding our role in ruining the planet work, but this particular instance, it doesn't at all. We dwarves love the environment. Hey, make sure you go out and bid on our he hole tank NFT. The proceeds will go towards rebuilding the marshes. <laughs> oh. 
You ever realize you hit your comedic peak and that it's all downhill from here? This is laughable. It comes incredibly close to saying something, but just doesn't. Yes, yes, cycle of violence, bad. Do you have anything else to add? Oh no, put, put the golf club down. I, I promise, I, I still like this game. Ah! I want you to imagine the warmth of a campfire. The flame's faint glow illuminating a tiny clearing from the invasive darkness of the night sky. Two unlikely allies decompress after one of the worst days someone could experience, mentally preparing themselves to face their fiercest adversary tomorrow. Everything has been building up to this. They take a moment to reflect on the events that brought them together. One of them decides to lower the walls she's kept up most of her life. Kit explains that she came from an orphanage. The orphans didn't have much but each other until Lynx burned it all down, ruining her life. There is no voice acting in Chrono Cross, but you can practically hear the bitterness in Kid's voice as she was forced back into a life of solitude she was able to escape thanks to the love of a stranger. She has suffered so much to simply survive. She expresses her distaste with humanity, and knowing what she's gone through, you can understand why she feels this way. Her erratic actions and behavior make sense now. In her mind, vengeance is the only thing left to keep her going. All she really cares about is killing Lynx. Despite this moment being a grim one, Surge realizes something. This girl who seems to trust no one has proven that she considers him a friend without ever explicitly saying it. This moment is powerful, dark, human, and ultimately beautiful. Until you realize you can miss this whole event and never learn of kids' motivations. I got the scene when I first played, but it was absent on this playthrough, and I genuinely don't know why. I've looked all over the internet, but no one can give me a straight answer on why the game is designed like this. This should be mandatory, easily could be with a few tweaks, and ultimately hurts the story with its potential exclusion. Why, you ask? Guess you'll have to wait for part two, because it's not gonna come back until around the end. I originally thought this would be unlocked by making the effort to save Kid's life. After everything you've been through with her, everything you've sacrificed and forced others to give up for her sake, you'd have this moment of reflection. But nope! The most I was able to figure out was that saving Razli or denying Kid the first time probably had something to do with this scene not being here, but I literally have no idea. If it wasn't obvious, this was not my footage. YouTuber Kbash had some left over from his amazing video on both Chrono games, and let me use it. But to add insult to injury, in his playthrough, he got X-Cut. So I honestly don't know why the game felt the need to waggle its Crypt Keeper fingers in my face once again. Let me engage with your story, Cross. I'm begging you here. At this point, you're thinking, Cross feels very different from Trigger. Edgier, more polygonal. The tone of the writing is, well, different. Okay, what do you want from me? Let me write my scripts with my uncreative adjectives in peace. Look, I've been avoiding comparing the two Chrono games quality because that just wouldn't be fair. In terms of pacing and game design, Trigger is perfect in a way that I didn't find until I played a little indie darling named Dragon Quest XI. Hey, wait a second. Hmm. Hmm. I wonder if there's a connection. Psst. You want me to let you in on a little secret? Come here. It's because Chrono Trigger is just a Dragon Quest game. Yuji Horii, creator of the Dragon Quest series, wrote the majority of the scenario on Chrono Trigger with the help of Masato Kato. Four years later, Kato reappeared in the Squaresoft parking lot, naked and holding nothing but a finished production disc called Chrono Cross. Horii had nothing to do with this game, and it shows. Toriyama's art wasn't carried over. Cross is completely Kato's baby, and in a way, I respect that. The whole game feels like it's always trying to fight for the right to exist outside its predecessor's shadow. Shadow. And that's commendable, but his theming can be lacking at times and his directing leaves a bit to be desired. I'm sure development was utter hell, so it's not all his fault, but I'm not even sure more money in the purse and a longer dev time could have fixed the deep inherent flaws of Chrono Cross. But at the same time, 
I kind of believe those flaws add something to it. I used to think of Kato as a hack, but it's impossible to believe that anymore. For all the issues, when this game hits, oh man, it hits. Okay, I know how weird it sounds for me to say that, when it seems like I've been giving this game a lot of shit so far, and that's because this first act, which I fondly remember loving years ago, just wasn't doing it for me anymore. Without bringing up spoilers, the events of Fort Dragonia signify the end of the first act and the beginning of the second. Chrono Cross becomes a completely different game after this. Vaguely remembering what was coming, all I could do during the beginning of this new playthrough was brace myself and pay attention to details I missed the first time. While its stunning aesthetic blew me away, I didn't feel like a lot of the introduction stuff worked after you met Kid. Not a lot happens in those first 10 or so hours, and the story that's there was too unfocused and vague, or downright bad, for me to get attached to the characters. There are moments of brilliance, but they're sparse. At this point, I started to wonder, if I didn't like the first act anymore and I was convinced I didn't like anything after, was this game bad, plain and simple? Well, no. As I've grown up, my tastes have changed, but that isn't inherently a bad thing. Years of maturity have given me a new perspective. Adulthood has made me approach fiction I previously experienced in a new light. So as I entered Fort Dragonia again after all these years, and I thought I knew what to expect and was under the impression that I had all the answers, I was in for a rude awakening. This is where Cross really starts. The game I had neglected for most of my adult life. Because I just didn't get it. The game I was slowly but surely coming to terms with. And trust me, it's about to get hairy. You did it. You ended the video in the worst possible way. I'm so proud of you, me. Hey there, thanks for watching. This was a really big project and I'm looking to eventually getting to part two. I think before I get to that video, I wanna take a tiny break and make one or two small, maybe like 10 minute long videos, but it won't be that long before we get to the second part fingers crossed. But to throw around some quick thanks, big shout out to Supreme Zerker as always for helping me edit the script. Thanks to Xanderak for working on the thumbnail. And last but not least, a huge thanks to Kbash. He provided his voice for links in the Chrono Trigger bit and also let me use some of his footage. Make sure to go check all of them out. And of course, thank you to all of the wonderful people who support me on Patreon. If you'd like to join the list of people whose names are scrolling by right now, or hear your name shouted out like those in the upcoming segment, check out the Patreon to figure out how. The Metal Royal Slimes for this month are Courtney Littleton, Daniel Jennings, Enora Van, Furian's Nipples, Happy Emmons, Horncurling, I Frozen Ace, Jacob Faulkner, Jeremy DeForest, King Gestalt, Moon Watcher, Pinhead Nathan, Roxora, Sam G, Sly Gamer, Wayne Larkin, and your friend Chuck. Again, I hope you guys look forward to part two. Breaking them up into parts like this not only makes it easier to get content out to you guys, and lets me also go back and reflect on what I did in this video when I make the next one, but it also gives you guys time to play through it if you're interested in doing so. So that way, when part two comes out, we're both on the same page. That'll be it for me. Stay safe, stay happy, have an excellent one. Bye bye.